Preface of Goblins and Pagodas by John Gould Fletcher. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nemo. Goblins and Pagodas by John Gould Fletcher. Preface. One. The second half of the nineteenth and the first fifteen years of the twentieth century have been a period of research, of experiment, of unrest and questioning. In science and philosophy, we have witnessed an attempt to destroy the mechanistic theory of the universe as developed by Darwin, Huxley, and Spencer. The unknowable has been questioned. Hypothesis have been shaken. Vitalism and idealism have been proclaimed. In the arts, the tendency has been to strip each art of its inessentials and to disclose the underlying basis of pure form. In life, the principles of nationality, of racial culture, of individualism, of social development, of Christian ethics, have been discussed, debated, and examined from top to bottom, until at last, in the early years of the twentieth century, we find all Europe, from the leaders of thought down to the lowest peasantry, engaged in a mutually destructive war, of which few can trace the beginnings, and none can foresee the end. The fundamental tenets of thought art, life itself, have been shaken, and either civilization is destined to some new birth, or mankind will revert to the conditions of life, thought, and social intercourse that prevailed in the Stone Age. Like all men of my generation, I have not been able to resist this irresistible upheaval of ideas and of forces, and, to the best of my ability, I have tried to arrive at a clear understanding of the fundamentals of aesthetic form as they affect the art to which I have felt myself instinctively akin, the art of poetry. That I have completely attained such an understanding, it would be idle for me to pretend, but I believe and have induced some others to believe, that I have made a few steps toward it. Some explanation of my own peculiar theories and beliefs is necessary. However, to those who have not specifically concerned themselves with poetry, or who suffer in the presence of any new work of art from the normal human reaction, that all art principles are so essentially fixed that any departure from accepted ideas is madness. 2. The fundamental basis of all the arts is the same. In every case, art aims at the evocation of some human emotion in the spectator or listener. Where science proceeds from effects to causes, and seeks to analyze the underlying causes of emotion and sensation, Art reverses the process, and constructs something that will awaken emotions, according to the amount of receptiveness with which other people approach it. Thus architecture gives us feelings of density, proportion, harmony, sculpture of masses in movement, painting of color harmony, and the ordered composition of lines and volumes from which arise sensations of space, music of the development of sounds into melodic line, harmonic progression, tonal opposition, and symphonic structure. The object of literature is not dissimilar from these. Literature aims at releasing the emotions that arise from the formed words of a certain language. But literature is probably a less pure 
and hence more universal, art than any I have yet examined. For it must be apparent to all minds that not only is a word a definite symbol of some fact, but also it is a thing capable of being spoken or sounded. The art of literature, then, in so far as it deals with definite statements, is akin to painting or photography. In so far as it deals with sounded words, it is akin to music. 3. Literature, therefore, does not depend on the peculiar twist and quirks which represent, to those who can read, the words, but rather on the essential words themselves. In fact, literature existed before writing, and writing in itself is of no value from the purely literary sense, except in so far as it preserves and transmits from generation to generation the literary emotion. Style, whether in prose or poetry, is an attempt to develop this essentially musical quality of literature, to evoke the magic that exists in the sound quality of words, as well as to combine these sound qualities in definite statements or sentences. The difference between prose and poetry is, therefore, not a difference of means, but of psychological effect and reaction. The means employed, the formed language, is the same but the resultant impression is quite different. In prose, the emotions expressed are those that are capable of development in a straight line. In so far as prose is pure, it confines itself to the direct orderly progression of a thought or conception or situation from point to point of a flat surface. The sentences, as they develop this conception, from its beginning to conclusion, move on, and do not return upon themselves. The grouping of these sentences into paragraphs gives the breadth of the thought. The paragraphs, sections, and chapters are each a square, in that they represent a division of the main thought into parallel units, or blocks of subsidiary ideas. The sensation of depth is finally obtained by arranging these blocks in a rising climactic progression, or in parallel lines, or in a sort of zigzag figure. The psychological reaction that arises from the intelligent appreciation of poetry is quite different. In poetry, we have a succession of curves. The direction of the thought is not in straight lines, but wavy and spiral. It rises and falls on gust of strong emotion. Most often, it creates strongly marked loops and circles. The structure of the stanza, or strophe, always tends to be spherical. Depth is obtained by making one sphere contain a number of concentric or overlapping spheres. Hence, when we speak of poetry, we usually mean regular rhyme and meter which have for so long been considered essential to all poetry, not as a device for heightening musical effect, as so many people suppose, but merely to make these loops and circles more accentuated, and to make the line of the poem turn upon itself more recognizably. But it must be recognized that just as Giotto's circle was none the less a circle, although not drawn with compasses, so poetic circles can be constructed out of subtler and more musical curves than that which painstakingly follows the self-same progression of beats and catches itself up on the same point of rhyme for line after line. The key pattern on the lip of a Greek vase may be beautiful, but it is less beautiful, less satisfying, and less conclusive a test of artistic ability than the composition of satyrs and of menads struggling about the center. Therefore, I maintain 
and will continue to do so, that the mere craftsman ability to write in regular lines and meters no more makes a man a poet than the ability to stencil wallpapers makes him a painter. Rather, it is more important to observe that almost any prose work of imaginative literature, if examined closely, will be found to contain a plentiful sprinkling of excellent verses, while many poems, which the world hails as masterpieces, contain whole pages of prose. The fact is that prose and poetry are to literature as composition and color are to painting, or as light and shadow to the day or male and female, to mankind. There are no absolutely perfect poets, and no absolutely perfect prose writers. Each partakes of some of the characteristics of the other. The difference between poetry and prose is, therefore, a difference between a general roundness and a general squareness of outline. A great French critic, recently dead, who devoted perhaps the major part of his life to the study of the aesthetics of the French tongue, declared that Flaubert and Chateaubriand wrote only poetry. If there are those who cannot see that in the only true and lasting sense of the word, poetry, this remark was perfectly just, then all I have written above will be in vain. 4. Along with the prevailing preoccupation with technique, which so marks the early 20th century, there has gone also a great change in the subject matter of art. Having tried to explain the aesthetic form basis of poetry, I shall now attempt to explain my personal way of viewing its content. It is a significant fact that every change in technical procedure in the arts is accompanied by, and grows out of, a change in subject matter. To take only one out of innumerable examples, the new subject matter of Wagner's music dramas, of an immeasurably higher order than the usual libretto, created a new form of music, based on motifs, not melodies. Other examples can easily be discovered. The reason for this is not difficult to find. No sincere artist cares to handle subject matter that has already been handled and exhausted. It is not a question of a desire to avoid plagiarism, or of self-conscious searching for novelty, but of a perfectly spontaneous and normal appeal which any new subject matter always makes. Hence, when a new subject appears to any artist, he always realizes it more vividly than an old one. And if he is a good artist, he realizes it so vividly that he recreates it in what is practically a novel form. This novel form never is altogether novel, nor is the subject altogether a new subject. For, as I pointed out at the beginning of this preface, that all arts sprang practically out of the same primary sensations. So the subject matter of all art must forever be the same, namely, nature in human life. Hence, any new type of art will always be found, in subject matter as well as in technique, to have its roots in the old. Art is like a kaleidoscope, capable of many changes, while the material which builds up those changes remains the same. Nevertheless, although the subject matter in this book is not altogether new, yet I have realized it in a way which has not often been tried. And out of that fresh and quite personal realization have sprung my innovation in subject as well as technique. Let me illustrate by a concrete example. 5. A book lies on my desk. It has a red binding and is badly printed on cheap paper. I have had this book with me for several years. Now, 
Suppose I were to write a poem on this book, how would I treat the subject? If I were a poet following in the main the Victorian tradition, I should write my poem altogether about the contents of this book and its author. My poem would be essentially a criticism of the subject matter of the book. I should state at length how that subject matter had affected me. In short, what the reader would obtain from this sort of poem would be my sentimental reaction towards certain ideas and tendencies in the work of another. If I were a realist poet, I should write about the book's external appearance. I should expatiate on the red binding, the bad type, the ink stain on page 16. I should complain, perhaps, of my poverty at not being able to buy a better edition and conclude with a jibe at the author for not having realized the sufferings of the poor. Neither of these ways, however, of writing about this book possesses any novelty, and neither is essentially my own way. My own way of writing about it would be as follows. I should select out of my life the important events connected with my ownership of this book, and strive to write of them in terms of the volume itself, both his regard subject matter and appearance. In other words, I should link up my personality and the personality of the book, and make each a part of the other. In this way I should strive to evoke a soul out of this piece of inanimate matter, a something characteristic and structural inherent in this inorganic form, which is friendly to me and responds to my mood. This method is not new, although it has not often been used in Occidental countries. Professor Fenoloso, in his book on Chinese and Japanese art, states that it was universally employed by the Chinese artists and poets of the Song period in the 11th century AD. He calls this doctrine of the interdependence of man and inanimate nature the cardinal doctrine of Zen Buddhism. The Zen Buddhists evolved it from the still earlier Taoist philosophy, which undoubtedly inspired Li Po and the other great Chinese poets of the 7th and 8th centuries A.D. 6. In the first poems of this volume, The Ghost of an Old House, I have followed the method already described. I have tried to evoke, out of the furniture and surroundings of a certain old house, definite emotions which I have had concerning them. I have tried to relate my childish terror concerning this house, a terror not uncommon among children, as I can testify, to the aspects that called it forth. In the symphonies, which form the second part of this volume, I have gone a step further. My aim in writing these was, from the beginning, to narrate certain important phases of the emotional and intellectual development, in short, the life of an artist. Not necessarily myself, but of that sort of artist with which I might find myself most in sympathy. And here, not being restrained by any definite material phenomena, as in the old house, I have tried to state each phase in the terms of a certain color, or combination of colors, which is emotionally akin to that phase. This color, and the imaginative phantasmagoria of landscape which it evokes, thereby creates, in a definite and tangible form, the dominant mood of each poem. The emotional relations that exist between form, color, and sound have been little investigated. It is perfectly true that certain colors affect certain temperaments differently, but it is also true that there is a science of color, and that certain of its laws are already universally known, if not explained. Naturally enough, it is to the painters 
we must first turn if we want to find out what is known about color. We discover that painters continually are speaking of hot and cold color, red, yellow, orange being generally hot, and green, blue, and violet cold. Mixed colors being classed hot and cold according to the proportions they contain of the hot and cold colors. We also discover that certain colors will not fit certain forms, but rebel at the combination. This is so far true that scarcely any landscape painter finishes his picture from nature, but in the studio. And almost any art student painting a landscape will disregard the color before him and employ the color scheme of his master or of some painter he admires. As Delacroix noted in his journal, a conception, having become a composition, must move in the milieu of a color peculiar to it. There seems to be a particular tone belonging to some part of every picture, which is a key that governs all the other tones. Therefore, we must admit that there is an intimate relation between color and form. It is the same with color and sounds. Many musicians have observed the phenomenon that when certain notes or combinations of them are sounded, certain colors are also suggested to the eye. A Russian composer, Skriabin, went so far as to construct color scales. And an English scientist, Professor Wallace Remington, has built an organ which plays in colors instead of notes. Unfortunately, the musicians have given this subject less attention than the painters, and therefore our knowledge concerning the relations of color and sound is more fragmentary and incomplete. Nevertheless, these relations exist, and it is for the future to develop them more fully. Literature, and especially poetry, as I have already pointed out, partakes of the character of both painting and music. The Impressionist method is quite as applicable to writing as it is to landscape. Poems can be written in major or minor keys, can be as full of dominant motif as a Wagner music drama, and even susceptible of fugal treatment. Literature is the common ground of many arts, and, in its highest development, such as the drama as practiced in 5th century Athens, is found allied to music, dancing, and color. Hence, I have called my works symphonies, when they are really dramas of the soul, and hence in them I have used color for verity, for ornament, for drama, for its inherent beauty, and for intensifying the form of the emotion that each of these poems is intended to evoke. 7. Let us take an artist, a young man at the outset of his career. His years of searching, of fumbling, of other men's influence are coming to an end. Sure of himself, he yet sees that he will spend all his life pursuing a vision of beauty which will elude him at the very last. This is the first symphony, which I have called the Blue, because Blue suggests to me depth, mystery, and distance. He finds himself alone in a great city, surrounded by noise and clamor. It is as if millions of lives were tugging at him, drawing him away from his art, tempting him to go out and whelm his personality in this black whirlpool of struggle and failure on which float golden specks, the illusory bliss of life. But he sees that all this is only another illusion, like his own. Here we have the symphony in black and gold. He emerges from the city, and in the country is re-intoxicated with desire for life by spring. He vows himself 
to a self-sufficing pagan worship of nature. This is the Green Symphony. Quickened by spring, he dreams of a marvelous golden city of art, full of fellow workers. This city appears to him at times like some Italian town of the Renaissance, at others like some strange oriental golden-roofed monastery temple. He sees himself dead in the desert, far away from it. Yet its blossoming is ever about him. Something divine has been born of him after death. So he passes to the White Symphony, the central poem of this series, in which I have sought to describe the artist's struggle to attain unutterable and superhuman perfection. The struggle goes on from the midsummer of his life to midwinter. The end of it is stated in the poem. There follows a brief interlude, which I have called a symphony in white and blue. These colors were chosen, perhaps, more idiosyncratically in this case than in the others. I have tried to depict the sort of temptation that besets most artists at this stage of their career, the temptation to abandon the struggle for the sake of a purely sensual existence. In this case, however, the appeal of sensuality is conveyed under the guise of a dream. It is resisted, and the struggle begins anew. War breaks out, not alone in the external world, but in the artist's soul. He finds he must follow his personality wherever it leads him despite all obstacles. This is the Orange Symphony. Now follow long years of struggle and neglect. He is shipwrecked, and still afar he sees his city of art. But this time it is red, a phantom mocking his impotent rage. Old age follows. All is violet, the color of regret and remembrance. He is living only in the past, his life a succession of dreams. Lastly, all things fade out into absolute gray, and it is now midwinter. Looking forth on the world again, he still sees war, like a monstrous red flower dominating mankind. He hears the souls of the dead declaring that they, too, have died for an adventure even as he is about to die. Such, in the briefest possible analysis, is the meaning of the poems contained in this book. January 1916 End of Preface Section 1 of Goblins and Pagodas by John Gould Fletcher. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Nemo. The Ghost of an Old House. Prologue. The house that I write of faces the north. No sun ever seeks its six white columns the nine great windows of its face. It fronts four square the winds. Under the penthouse of the veranda roof, the upper northern rooms gloom outwards mournfully. Staring ionic capitals peer in them, owl-like faces. On winter nights, the wind, sidling round the corner, shoots upwards with laughter. The windows rattle as if someone were in them wishing to get out and ride upon the wind. Doors lead to nowhere. Squirrels burrow between the walls. Closets in every room hang open. Windows are stared into by uncivil ancient trees. In the middle of the upper hallway, there is a great circular hole going up to the attic. 
a wooden lid covers it. All over the house there is a sense of futility, of minutes dragging slowly and repeating some worn-out story of broken effort and desire. End of section. Section 2 of Goblins and Pagodas by John Gould Fletcher. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Nemo. Part 1 The House. Bedroom. The clump of jessamine, softly beneath the rain, rocks its golden flowers. In this room, my father died. His bed is in the corner. No one has slept in it since the morning when he wakened to meet death's hands at his heart. I cannot go to this room without feeling something big and angry waiting for me to throw me on the bed and press its thumbs in my throat. The clump of jessamine without beneath the rain rocks its golden flowers. Library. Stuffy smell of moldering leather, tattered armchairs, creaking doors, books that slovenly elbow each other, sewn with children's scrawls and long worn out by contact with generations, tattered tramps displaying yourselves. We, though you broke our backs, did not complain. If I had my way, I would take you out and bury you quickly, or give you to the clean fire. Indian Skull Someone dug this up and brought it to our house. In the dark upper hall I see it dimly, looking at me through the glass, where dancers have danced and weary people have crept to their bedrooms in the morning, where sick people have tossed all night where children have been born, where feet have gone up and down, where anger has blazed forth and strange looks have passed. It is rested, watching meanwhile the opening and shutting of doors, the coming and going of people, the carrying out of coffins. Earth still clings to its eye sockets. It will wait till its vengeance is accomplished. Old Nursery In the tired face of the mirror there is a blue curtain reflected. If I could lift the reflection, peer a little beyond, I would see a boy crying because his sister is ill in another room and he has no one to play with. A boy listlessly scattering building blocks and crying because no one will build for him the palace of Fairy Morgana. I cannot lift the curtain. It is stiff and frozen. The Back Stairs In the afternoon, when no one is in the house, I suddenly hear dull, dragging feet go fumbling down those dark back stairs that climb up twisting as if they wanted no one to see them. Beating a dirge upon the bare planks, I hear those feet and the creak of a long locked door. My mother often went up and down those selfsame stairs. From the room where by the window she would sit all day and listlessly look on the world that had destroyed her. She would go down in the evening to the room where she would sleep, or rather not sleep, but all night lie staring fiercely at the ceiling. In the afternoon, when no one is in the house, I suddenly hear dull dragging feet beating out their futile tune up and down those dark back stairs. But there is no one in the shadows. The Wall Cabinet Above the steep back stairs, so high that only a ladder can come to it, there is a wall cabinet hidden away. No one ever unlocks it. The key is lost. The door is barred. 
it is shut and still. Some say a previous tenant filled its shelves with rows of bottles, bottles of spirit filled with spiders. I do not know. Above the sleepy still back stairs, it watches, shut and still. The cellar, faintly lit by a high barred grating, the low hung cellar flattens itself under the house. In one corner there is a little door, so low it can scarcely be seen. Beyond, there is a narrow room. One must feel for the walls in the dark. One shrinks to go to the end of it, feeling the smooth, cold wall. Why did the builders who made this house stow one room away like this? The front door. It was always the place where our farewells were taken when we traveled to the north. I remember that there was one who made some journey, but did not come back. Many years they waited for him. At last, the one who wished the most to see him was carried out of the self-same door in death. Since then, all our family partings have been at another door. End of section. Section 3 of Goblins and Pagodas by John Gould Fletcher. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Nemo. Part 2 The Attic. In the attic, dust hangs clogged so thick the air has a dusty taste. Spider threads cling to my face from the broad pine beams. There is nothing living here. The house below might be quite empty. No sound comes from it. The old broken trunks and boxes, cracked and dusty pictures, legless chairs and shattered tables, seem to be crying softly in the stillness because no one has brushed them. No one has any use for them now. Yet I often wonder if these things are really dead, if the old trunks never open, letting out gray, flapping things at twilight, if it is all as safe and dull as it seems. Why, then, is the stair so steep? Why is the doorway always locked? Why does nobody ever come? The Calendar in the Attic I wonder how long it has been since this old calendar hung here, with my birthday date upon it. Nothing else, not a word of writing, not a mark of any hand. Perhaps it was my father who left it thus for me to see. Perhaps my mother smiled as she saw it, but in later years did not smile. If I could tear it down from the wall somehow, I would be content, but I am afraid, as a little child, to touch it. The Hoop Skirt In the night when all are sleeping, up here a tiny old dame comes tripping, looking for her lost hoop skirt. My great-grand-aunt, I never saw her, her ghost doesn't know me from another. She stalks up the attic stairs angrily. The dust sets her sneezing and coughing. By the trunk she is limping and hopping. But alas, the trunk is locked. What's an old dame to do, anyway? Must stay in a moldy grave, day on day, or go to heaven out of style. In the night, when all are snoring, the old lady makes a dreadful clatter, going down the attic stairs. What was that? A ghost or a burglar? Oh, it was only the wind in the chimney, yes, and the attic door that slammed. The Little Chair I know not why, when I saw the little chair, I suddenly desired to sit in it. 
I know not why, when I sat in the little chair, everything changed, and life came back to me. I am convinced no one at all has grown up in the house. The break that I dreamed itself was a dream and is broken. I will sit in the little chair and wait till the others come looking after me. And if it is after nightfall, they will come. So much the better. For the little chair holds me as tightly as death, and rocking in it, I can hear it whisper strange things. In the dark corner, I brush the dust from this old portrait. Yes, it is the same face, exactly. Why does it look at me still with such a look of hate? I brush the dust from a heap of magazines. Here, there is all what you have written, all that you struggled long years and went down to darkness for. Oh, God, to think what I am writing will be ever as this. Oh, God, to think that my own face may some day glare from this dust. THE TOY CABINET By the old toy cabinet I stand and turn over dusty things, chessmen, card games, hoops and balls, toy rifles, helmets, swords, in the far corner a doll's tea set in a box. Where are you, golden child? Who gave tea to your dolls and me? The golden child is growing old, further than Rome or Babylon. From you have passed those foolish years. She lives, she suffers, she forgets. By the old toy cabinet, I idly stand and awkwardly finger the lock of the tea set box. What matter? Why should I look inside? Perhaps it is empty after all. Leave old things to the ghost of old. My stupid brain refuses thought. I am maddened with a desire to weep. The Yardstick Yardstick that measured out so many miles of cloth. Yardstick that covered me. I wonder, do you hop of nights out to the still hill cemetery and up and down go measuring a clayey grave for me? End of section. Section 4 of Goblins and Pagodas by John Gould Fletcher. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Nemo. Part 3 The Lawn. The Three Oaks. There are three ancient oaks that grow near to each other. They lift their branches high as beckoning with outstretched arms for someone to come and stand under the canopy of their leaves. Once long ago, I remember, as I lay in the very center, between them, a rotten branch suddenly fell near to me. I will not go back to those oaks. Their branches are too black for my liking. An oak. Hoar mistletoe hangs in clumps to the twisted boughs of this lonely tree. Beneath its roots I often thought treasure was buried, for the roots had enclosed a circle. But when I dug beneath them, I could only find great black ants that attacked my hands. When at night I have the nightmare, I always see the eyes of ants swarming from a moldering box of gold. Another Oak Poison ivy crawls at its root. I dare not approach it. It has an air of hate. One would say a man had been hanged to its branches. It holds them in such a way. The moon gets tangled in it. A distant steeple seems to bark from its belfry to the sky. Something that no one ever loved is buried here. Some gray shape of deadly hate crawls on the back fence just beyond. Now I remember, once I went out by night too near this oak, and a red cat suddenly leapt from the dark and clawed my face. 
The Old Barn Owls flap in this ancient barn with rotted doors. Rats squeak in this ancient barn over the floors. Owls flap warily every night. Rats' eyes gleam in the cold moonlight. There's something hidden in this barn with barred doors. Something the owls have torn and the rats scurry with over the floors. The well. The well is not used now. Its waters are tainted. I remember there was once a man went down to clean it. He found it very cold and deep. With a queer niche in one of its sides, from which he hauled forth buckets of bricks and dirt. The Trees When the moonlight strikes the treetops, the trees are not the same. I know they are not the same, because there is one tree that is missing, and it stood so long by another, that the other, feeling lonely, now is slowly dying too. When the moonlight strikes the treetops, the dead tree comes back like a great blue sphere of smoke, half buoyed, half raveling on the grass, rustling through frayed branches, something eerily cheeping through it, something creeping through its shade. Vision You who flutter and quiver an instant, just beyond my apprehension. Lady, I will find the white orchid for you if you will but give me one smile between those wayward drifts of hair. I will break the wild berries that loop themselves over the marsh pool, for your sake, and the long green canes that swish against each other, I will break to set in your hands. For there is no wonder like to you, you who flutter and quiver an instant, just beyond my apprehension. Epilogue Why it was, I do not know. But last night, I vividly dreamed, though a thousand miles away, that I had come back to you. The windows were the same, the bed, the furniture the same. Only there was a door where empty wall had always been, and someone was trying to enter it. I heard the grate of a key, an unknown voice apologetically excused its intrusion just as I awoke. But I wonder, after all, if there was some secret entranceway, some ghost I overlooked when I was there. End of section. Section 5 of Goblins and Pagodas by John Gould Fletcher. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Nemo. Symphonies, Blue Symphony. One. The darkness rolls upward. The thick darkness carries with it rain and a ravel of cloud. The sun comes forth upon earth. Paley the dawn leaves me facing timidly, old gardens sunken, and in the gardens is water. Somber wreck, autumnal leaves, shadowy roofs in the blue mist, and a willow branch that is broken. Oh, old pagodas of my soul, how you glittered across green trees, blue and cool. Blue, tremulously, blow faint puffs of smoke across somber pools. The damp green smell of rotted wood, and a heron that cries from out the water. 2. Through the upland meadows I go alone, for I dreamed of someone last night who is waiting for me. Flower and blossom. Tell me, do you know of her? Have the rocks hidden her voice? They are very blue and still. Long upward road that is leading me, light-hearted I quit you. 
for the long loose ripples of the meadow grass invite me to dance upon them quivering grass daintily poised for her foot's tripping oh blown clouds could i only race up like you oh the last slopes that are sun drenched and steep look the sky across black valleys rise blue white aloft jagged unwrinkled mountains ranges of death solitude silence three one chuckles by the brook for me one rages under the stone one makes a spout of his mouth one whispers one is gone one over there on the water spreads cold ripples for me enticingly the vast dark trees flow like blue veils of tears into the water sour sprites moaning and chuckling what have you hidden from me in the palace of the blue stone she lies forever bound hand and foot was it the wind that rattled the reeds together dry reeds a faint shiver in the grasses four on the left hand there is a temple and a palace on the right hand side foot passengers in scarlet pass over the glittering tide under the bridge the old river flows low and monotonous day after day i have heard and have seen all the news that has been autumn's gold and spring's green now in my palace i see foot passengers crossing the river pilgrims of autumn in the afternoons lotus pools petals in the water these are my dreams for me silks are outspread i take my ease unthinking five and now the lowest pine branch is drawn across the disk of the sun old friends who will forget me soon i must go on towards those blue death mountains i have forgot so long in the marsh grasses there lies forever my last treasure with the hopes of my heart the ice is glazing over torn lanterns flutter on the leaves is snow in the frosty evening told the old bell for me once in the sleepy temple Perhaps my soul will hear. Afterglow. Before the stars peep, I shall creep out into darkness. End of section. Section 6 of Goblins and Pagodas by John Gould Fletcher. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Nemo Solitude in the City Symphony in Black and Gold One Words at Midnight Because the night is so still Because there's no one about Not the tiny squeak of a mouse over the carpet Nor the slow beat of a clock at the top of the stairway I am afraid of the night that is coming to me. I know out there someone is thinking of me. Someone is wondering about me. Someone is needing me. Someone is dying for my sake. Yet I remain alone. I know that life is calling. I cannot resist it. Too much of myself I have given ever to turn away. I know that shame, sickness, death itself shall befall me, and I am afraid. O oh, night, hide me in your long, cold arms. Let me sleep, 
but let me not live this life. There are too many people with haggard eyes standing before me saying, to live you must suffer even as we. Yet life bitterly bids me go on to the last, no matter the mud and the cold rain and the darkness, no matter the drear pilgrims in whose eyes you shall look for long and see all suffering, madness, death, and despair. Because my heart is cramped in, because I've suffered much, because my hope is like a candle flame quenched at midnight, because I dare dream yet of joy, I can take my night and the life that is coming to me. 2. The Evening Rain Oh, the rain of the evening is an infinite thing, as it slowly slips on the motionless pavement. Greasy and gray is the rain of the evening, as it dribbles into the dirty gutters and slides down the drains with a roar. Ragged men cower under the doorways. Umbrellas nod like drowsy birds. Bat umbrellas, teetering, balancing. Where will you spread your wings tonight? Tangled between the factory chimneys, I have seen the golden lamps wake this evening, spinning and whirling, darting and dancing, tangled with the glittering rain. Omnibuses lurch heavenly homeward, elephants tinseled in tawdry gold, taxicabs fight like wild birds squalling, wild birds with roaring, clattering wings. Oh, the rain of the evening is an infinite thing, as it shivers to jewel heaps spilt on the pavement. The facades frown gloomily at its beauty. The facades are dreaming of the day. With rippling, curling, serpentine convolutions, the pavements drip with drunken light. Crimson and gold, shot with opal, they glare against the sullen night. Oh, the rain of the evening is an infinite thing, as it slowly dries on the dirty pavement. Red, low-browed clouds jut over the sky, and in the cool sky there are stars. 3. Street of Sorrows You street of sorrows, bending over your golden lamps in the evening, dark street that is very silent, and everywhere the same. Elsewhere there is song and riot, like golden fireflies flickering. Elsewhere the crane's gaunt muscles tug the city up to the stars. But who in the dawn should come near you? There are dry leaves rattling behind him. And who should come in the noonday? There are shadows that squat on the pave. And who should come in the evening? There is one, a ship in dark waters. And who should come at nightfall to feel cold hands at his heart? You street of solitude, waiting, patient and still in the evening. Old street that is very weary and everywhere the same. You that have seen joy passing into pain, into tears, into darkness, street of the dead and musty, I have drunk your cold poison tonight. 4. Song in the Darkness It is the last night that I can be solitary. Henceforth the keys and wards of me are held in other hands. Dark clouds trail over the sky, troops of song retreating. But in the sunset, once more have I seen aloft incredible summits of gold far on the south horizon. One purple veil of rain floats downward over the city, and as it settles slowly, the light goes out of it. Chimneys 
with massive summits stand gaunt and black and evil like a river of lead to seaward the river steadily rolls it is the last night that i can be solitary life takes me in black coils one green light glitters then a swift taxi scatters another as it speeds on the chimneys rank their motionless forces against the swift movement of tugs in the stream against the flame chariots of the embankment against the bowing trees against the blowing smoke against the busy rain with dying might the light invades the city's hall curtained by dripping fringes of buoyant tattered cloud tossed by the wind it is the last night that i can be solitary and all my city of dreams is burning up tonight but yet there waits for me something lost back in the darkness something i have never seized a shape a voice a gesture something behind my shoulder gray robes that stir and rustle something that moves away from me when i would touch it with my hand cities of the beyond what great black-walled horizons dare you climb up and down what steep incredible valleys i suddenly perceive that i have been mocked in you and therefore will i sow the earth with rain of stars tonight it is the last night that I can be solitary. The rain invites to drunkenness. The wind blows through my brain. Ship-like, the sliding golden trams procession by an inner cross. With tulips, daffodils, crocuses, the whole street blossoms at my feet. Now kindle flames and let blow out the crimson rose against the gray. Let night itself be blotted out in life's monotonous drone of day. It is the last night that I can be solitary. It is the last time that no feet but mine can beat upon the floor. It is the last time that no hands but mine can pound upon my heart. It is the last time that no voice but mine can cry and yet be lost. It is the last time I shall see the pavements like a mirror stare at me. End of section. Section 7 of Goblins and Pagodas by John Gould Fletcher this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Nemo Green Symphony 1. The glittering leaves of the rhododendrons balance and vibrate in the cool air, while in the sky above them white clouds chase each other. Like scampering rabbits, flashes of sunlight sweep the lawn, they fling in passing patterns of shadow, golden and green. With long cascades of laughter, the mating birds dart and swoop to the turf. Mid their mad trillings glints the gay sun behind the trees. Down there are deep blue lakes, orange blossom droops in the water. In the tower of the winds, all the bells are set adrift jingling for the dawn thin fluttering streamers of breeze lash through the swaying boughs palely expectant the earth receives the slanting rain i am a glittering raindrop hugged close by the cool rhododendron i am a daisy starring the exquisite curves of the close-cropped turf the glittering leaves of the rhododendron are shaken like blue-green blades of grass, flickering, cracking, falling, splintering in a million fragments. 
The wind runs laughing up the slope, stripping off handfuls of wet green leaves to fling in people's faces. Wallowing on the daisy powdered turf, clutching at the sunlight, cavorting in the shadow. Like baroque pearls, like cloudy emeralds, the clouds and the trees clash together, whirling and swirling in the tumult of the spring and the wind. Two. The trees splash the sky with their fingers, a restless green rout of stars. With whirling movement, they swing their boughs about their stems. Planes on planes of light and shadow pass among them, opening fan-like to fall. The trees are like a sea, tossing, trembling, roaring, wallowing, darting their long green flickering fronds up at the sky, spotted with white blossom spray. The trees are roofs, hollow caverns of cool blue shadow, solemn arches in the afternoons. The whole vast horizon in terrace beyond terrace, pinnacle above pinnacle, lifts to the sky serrated ranks of green on green. They caress the roofs with their fingers, they sprawl about the river to look into it. Up the hill they come, gesticulating challenge. They cower together in dark valleys. They yearn out over the fields. Enamel domes tumble upon the grass, crashing in ruin, quiet at last. The trees lash the sky with their leaves, uneasily shaking their dark green manes. 3. Far let the voices of the mad wild birds be calling me. I will abide in this forest of pines. When the wind blows battling through the forest, I hear it distantly, the crash of a perpetual sea. When the rain falls, I watch silver spears slanting downwards from pale river pools of sky, enclosed in dark fronds. When the sun shines, I weave together distant branches till they enclose mighty circles. I sway to the movement of hooded summits. I swim leisurely in deep blue seas of air. I hug the smooth bark of stately red pillars, and with cones carefully scattered, I mark the progression of dark dial shadows flung diagonally downwards through the afternoon. This turf is not like turf. It is a smooth, dry carpet of velvet, embroidered with brown patterns of needles and cones. These trees are not like trees. They are innumerable feathery pagoda umbrellas, stiffly ungracious to the wind, teetering on red lacquered stems. In the evening, I listen to the winds lisping, while the conflagrations of the sunset flicker and clash behind me, flamboyant crenellations of glory amid the charred ebony bowls. In the night, the fiery nightingales shall clash and trill through the silence, like the voices of mermaids crying from the sea. Long ago has the moon whelmed this uncompleted temple, Stars swim like goldfish far above the black arches. Far let the timid feet of dawn fly to catch me. I will abide in this forest of pines. For I have unveiled naked beauty, and the things that she whispered to me in the darkness are buried deep in my heart. Now let the black tops of the pine trees break like a spent wave against the gray sky. These are tombs and memorials and temples and altars, sun kindled for me. End of section. Section 8 
of Goblins and Pagodas by John Gould Fletcher. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Nemo. Golden Symphony. One. Seen from afar, the city today is like a golden cloud, strayed from the sky and molded into dim, motionless towers. Music is passing far off. Music serenely is climbing up and vanishing on the long gray stairways of the sky in fan-like rays of light. Now it falls slowly, careering, toppling, shivering and quivering like burnished glass or laburnum blossom, golden cascades. Peace. Now let the music sound from further away, red bells out of memory's blue dream of regret. Seen from afar, the city today is like a fleet of sails, breaking the foam of dark forest in which I have strayed so long. They march together slowly, the golden temple terraces, against the dark remembrance of my pools of despair. O oh, golden Angelus, that sounded prolonging uncertain memories, I have seen the swallows hovering to you and followed their dark trails of passage. The gates of the city lie open, and the whole world goes homeward, full pulsing bells in the foreground, catching my soul with them on where the sun soars broadly through the incense dome of the sky. Two. High chimes from the belfry. The noonday approaches with its golden apparel rustling about its feet. High dreams of my city, where we, a band of brothers, build our proud dream of beauty before we fall into dust. The golden days have come for us, with mandolins, sword thrusts, laughter. Even the very dust of the street grows gold beneath our feet. Bronze bell notes poured from deep blue wells, molten gold out of the sky. Pillars of yellow marble on the summits of which the gods sleep. Now we are swimming. About us a great golden halo vibrates from us downwards, ebbing its life away. Golden clouds are circling like angels and archangels about the eye of the sun. Flaming sunset, mad conflagrations licking at the earth, the blue-black walls of space, iron mountains vast on the horizon. O oh, golden spear that dartled through the darkness, the evening star sparkled and threw us its message. Three. In the bosom of the desert, I will lie at the last. Not the gray desert of sand, but the golden desert of great wild grasses. This shall receive my soul. In the high plateaus, the wind will be like a flute note calling me day after day. Short burst of surf. The wind climbs up and stops in the grass, and the golden petals brush drowsily over my face. White butterfly that flutters across my sea of golden blossom, tell me, what are you looking for, lone white butterfly? I am seeking for a strange, lonely white flower. Its petals are honeyless, and in the wind it is still. White butterfly, come, fold your wings over my heart. I am the white blossom, the white dead blossom for you. In the golden bosom of the prairie, I am lying at the last, like a pool that is stilled. But they who shared with me my life's adventure, who tossed their ducats like dandelions into the sunlight, I know that somewhere they with songs are building, 
golden towers more beautiful than my own. 4. I only know in the midnight something will be born of me. The village drowses in the darkness, but aloft in the temple there is a thud of gongs and a shuffle of hollow voices in the dark corridors. The golden temple that kindled like a rose against the sunset now is dark and silent. One light glimmers from its facade. In the inner shrine, one stiff golden curtain hangs from floor to roof. Black, impassive, helmeted in felt like stiff black warriors, the lamas slowly gathered, kneeling in a row. The hollow brazen trumpets blare and snore, the drums festooned with skulls roar. Suddenly, with a clash of gongs and a squeal from ear splitting bugles, the golden veil is rent. Cavernous blue darkness, and within it, smiling, naked, rose empurpled, rippling with crimson violet light, behold the god. Hail, great jewel in the lotus blossom, rosy flame that kindling flashes on the emptiness or nirvana's sea. Before the shrine as before, once more the golden curtain and the black shapes vanish. Aloft in the hollow temple, there is a shuffle of feet and a sound of hollow voices, soon lost. The village drowses in the darkness, like a vast black cube, the temple looms above it. There is no light on its facade. Suddenly, all the golden temple kindles like a rose against the dawn. I only know in the midnight something has been born of me. End of section. Section 9 of Goblins and Pagodas by John Gould Fletcher. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Nemo. White Symphony. One. Forlorn and white, whorls of purity about a golden chalice. Immense the peonies flare and shatter their petals over my face. They slowly turn paler. They seem to be melting like blue-gray flakes of ice. Thin, grayish shivers, fluctuating mid the dark green lance thrust of the leaves. Like snowballs tossed, like soft white butterflies, the peonies poise in the twilight, and their narcotic, insinuating perfume draws me into them, shivering with a coolness, aching with a void. They kiss the blue chalice of my dreams like a gesture seen for an instant and then lost forever. Outwards the petals thrust to embrace me, pale daggers of coldness run through my aching breast. Outwards, still outwards, till on the brink of twilight they swirl downward silently flurry of snow in the void outwards still outwards till the blue walls are hidden and in the blinding white radiance of a whirlpool of clouds i awake like spraying rockets my peonies shower their glories on the night wavering perfumes drift about the garden shadows of the moonlight drift and ripple over the dew-gemmed leaves. Soar, crash, and sparkle, shoal of stars drifting like silver fishes through the black sluggish boughs. Towards the impossible, towards the inaccessible, towards the ultimate, towards the silence, towards the eternal, 
these blossoms go. The peonies spring like rockets in the twilight, and out of them all I rise. 2. Downwards through the blue abyss it slides, the white snow water of my dreams. Downwards, crashing from slippery rock into the boiling chasm, in which no eye dare look, for it is the chasm of death. Upwards from the blue abyss it rises, the chill water mist of my dreams. Upwards to the grayish weeping pines, and to skies of autumn ever about my heart. It is blue at the beginning, and blue-white against the gray greenness. It wavers in the upper air, catching unconscious sparkles, a rainbow glint of sunlight, and fading in the sad depths of the sky. Outwards rush the strong pale clouds, outwards and ever outwards, the blue-gray clouds, indistinguishable, one from another, nervous, sinewy, tossing their arms and brandishing, till on the blue serrations of the horizon they drench with their black rain a great peak of changeless snow. As evening came on, I climbed the tower, to gaze upon the city far beneath. I was not weary of day, but in the evening a white mist assembled and gathered over the earth and blotted it from sight. But to escape, to chase with the golden clouds galloping over the horizon, arrows of the northwest wind singing amid them, ruffling up my hair. As evening came on, the distance altered. Pale, wavering reflections rose from out the city, like sighs or the beckoning of half-invisible hands. Monotonously and sluggishly they crept upwards, a river that had spent itself in some chasm and dwindled and foamed at last at my weary feet. Autumn, golden fountains and the winds neighing amid the monotonous hills, Desolation of the old gods, rain that lifts and rain that moves away, in the green-black torrent, scarlet leaves. It was now perfectly evening, and the tower loomed like a gaunt peak in mid-air above the city. Its base was utterly lost. It was slowly coming on to rain, and the immense columns of white mist wavered and broke before the faint hurled spears. I will descend the mountains like a shepherd, and in the folds of tumultuous misty cities I will put all my thoughts, all my old thoughts, safely to sleep. For it is already autumn, O oh, whiteness of the pale southwestern sky, O oh, wavering dream that was not mine to keep, in midnight, in mournful moonlight, by paths I could not trace, I walked in the white garden. Each flower had a white face. Their perfume intoxicated me. Thus I began my dream. I was alone. I had no one to guide me. But the moon was like the sun. It stooped and kissed each waxen petal, one after one. Green and white was that garden. Diamond rain hung in the branches. You will not believe it. In the morning, at the dayspring, I wakened, shivering. Lo, the white garden that blossomed at my feet was a garden hidden in snow. It was my sorrow to see that all this was a dream. Three, blue, clogged with purple, mists uncoil themselves, sparkling to the horizon. I see the snow alone. In the deep blue chasm, boats sleep under gold thatch. Icicle-like trees fret faintly rose-touched sky. 
Under their heaped snow eaves, leaden houses shiver. Through thin blue crevices trickles an icy stream. The pines groan white-laden, the waves shiver, struck by the wind. Beyond from treeless horizons, broken snow peaks crawl to the sea. Wearily the snow glares through the gray silence day after day, mocking the colorless, cloudless sky with the reflection of death. There is no smoke through the pine tops, no strong red boatmen and pale green reeds, no herons to flicker an instant, no lanterns to glow with gay ray. No sails beat up to the harbor with creaking cordage and sailor's song. Somnolent, bare-poled, indifferent, they sleep and the city sleeps. Midwinter about them casts its dreary fortifications. Each day is a gaunt gray rock and death is the last of them all. Over the sluggish snow drifts now a pallid weak shower of bloom, boredom a fresh creation, death weariness of old returns. White, white blossom, fall of the shattered cups day on day, is there anything here that is not ancient, that has not bloomed a thousand years ago? Under the glare of the white-hot day, under the restless wind-rakes of the winter, white blossom or white snow scattered, and beneath them dark the graves. Dark graves never changing, white dream drifting, never changing above them. Oh, that the white scroll of heaven might be rolled up, and the naked Red lightning thrust at the smoldering earth. End of section. Section 10 of Goblins and Pagodas by John Gould Fletcher. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Nemo. Midsummer Dreams, Symphony in White and Blue 1. There is a tall white weed growing at the top of the sand hill. In the grass it is very still. It lifts its heavy bracts of flattened bloom against the sky, hazily gray with broom. Out over yonder boats pass and the swallows flatten themselves on the grass. The lake is silvering beneath the heat. The wind's feet touch lazily each crest, like white gulls slow flapping to windward. One rose-white cloud slowly disengages, loosening itself, and stands above the larkspur-colored water. Like Dione's daughter, braiding up her wet hair with her pale hands. 2. The moon puts out her face at a rift between the trees, which do not lift one drooping leaf this night of June. There is no lazy breeze to set them clashing adrift. Thin gleams of silver rise and break in the air, fireflies here and there, forest of blue masses suddenly quivering with rapid points of white? Are the forests beneath the sea where no breeze passes as still as you tonight? The moon puts out her face at a rift between the trees. Through my window, the bed cut evenly with diagonal shafts of light is a boat rocking out adrift. Under it bend the silver tips of the dark blue coral trees, and fireflies like glass fish drift and ripple upwards in the breeze. 3. 
we are drifting slowly you and i to where the clouds are lifting high fretted towers in the sky palaces of ivory which we look at dreamily over our sail frail white clouds drift as slowly over the undulant pale blue silk of the water as we we are racing swiftly you and i the sun darts one firm track through the blue black of the crinkled water gold spirals spattering flashing the water heaves and curls away at our bow a mad fish splashing we are rocked together you and i to this undulant movement white cloud with blue water blent cloud dripping down to wave its lazy head wave curling under cloud its cloudy blue i and you all alone alone at last i hold you fast four the midsummer clouds were piling up upon the south horizon mountains of drifting translucence in the larkspur fields of the sky ascending and toppling in crumbled ravines dribbling down chasms of silence reassembling in crowded multitudes massive forms one above another and i saw in their ridges and hollows the appearance of a woman immeasurable carven in stainless marble motionless naked fair her head thrown back her pointed breast up gleaming in chill sunlight her heavy flanks dark in the shadow resting forever inert and up to her there suddenly clomb and hurried another cloud huge hairy bulging and knobby with dark and knotted brows and he thrust out long bungling arms to her and drew himself up to her and i watched them melting together blue mouth to sad white mouth end of section section 11 of goblins and pagodas by john gould fletcher this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by nemo orange symphony one now that all the world is filled with armies clamoring now that men no longer live and die one by one but in vague indeterminate multitudes now that the trees are coppery towers now that the clouds loom southward now that the glossy creeper spatters the walls like spilt wine i will go out alone to catch strong joy of solitude where the tree lines in gold and scarlet swing strong grape cables up the smouldering face of the hill two guns crashing thudding ugulating tumultuous guns yelping over the cracked earth where dry bugles blare here in this hollow it is very quiet only the winds hissing laughter in the place of tombs one by one these gaunt scarred faces lift up blurred wrinkled inscriptions silently beseeching me to stop and ponder what does it matter if i do not stop to read them no one at all has gone this way that i have chosen before a leaf drops slowly in silence it is a long time twisting and hovering on its way to the earth guns booming bellowing crashing desperate insistent outcry of savage guns rocking the gloomy hollow i will run out like the wind snarling with savage laughter like the wind that tosses the gray-black clouds against the shot-racked barrier of flaming trees i will race between the gray guns and the clouds like shrapnel exploding flinging their hail through the tumult bursting will melt in cold spray 
I am the wanderer of the world. No one can hold me. Not the cannon assembled for battle, nor the gloomy graves of the hollow, nor the house where I long time slumbered, nor the hilltop where roads are straggling. My feet must march to the wind, like a leaf dropping slowly, an orange butterfly turning and twisting. I touch with moist, passionate palms the leaden inscriptions of my past. Then I turn to depart. 3. The trees dance about the inn. The wind thrusts them into flamelets. Now my thoughts, gypsying, go forth to strange walls and new fires. Mouth stained with brown-red berries, bronze cheeks sunken, unshaven, ragged attire. We swing our guitars at the hip as we tramp, heedless, uncaring. In the end the fire crackles, on the hearth the wine is simmering. Lift up the brown beaker one instant, drink deeply, fling out the last coin, let us go. On the plains there is drooping harvest, but no harvest can for a long time hold us. We have seen the winds, baffled, racing up the orange-flecked trench of the hills. 4. On the hill's summit, where the gusty wind all night long has assailed me, now I see stars vanishing before the long, cold, clutching fingers of dawn. Stars scintillant, fire-hued, metallic, topaz fruit of the deep blue garden. Southward you go, my constellations, and leave me with a white day alone. Over the hilltop swish with a scurry of wings millions of pale brown birds, songless, pulsing southward. Birds who have filled the trees and who fled long ago at my passing, now you clatter in heedless tumult, fanning with your hot wings my face. Carry this word to the southward. Say that I have forgotten them that wait for me. All the loves and the hates need expect me no longer. In the autumn, at last, I am alone. Suddenly, the wind crashes through the treetops, stripping away their orange-tiled domes, stark blue skeletons, forbidding, gesticulate in my face. You whom I planted and lavished, with all the wealth and beauty I had to bestow, hurry away, vain harvest. The wind scythes can reap you, where you lie on the earth, and to death's barns you can go. Beyond the hilltop I have seen only the sky, the wind, naked, prodding up black-furred clouds, Cossacks of winter. Cry, wind, shriek to the shivering Southland, that I am going into winter, that I do not hope to return. Farewell, crowded stars. Farewell, birds, winds, clouds and treetops. I, weary of you all, seek my destined joy in the Northland, amid blue ice and the rose-purple night of the pole. 5. Beyond the land there lies the sea, and on the sea with wings unfurled, bloodily huge the sunset rest, feathers flickering and claws curled, watching to seize the ruined world. Rolling in a torrent, brown leaves, my achievements, rise up from dark-wooded valleys and scatter themselves on the sea. Brown birds, my wild dreams, mingle their bodies together, shrieking and clamoring as they pass, black charred silhouettes against the west, curtained in orange flame. Now the wind starts up and strikes the seething water, hissing in uncoiled fury. Each foam-curled wave darts forward to clash and batter 
the smouldering iron rust cliff where the end of my road is lost rise up black clouds pounce upon the sunset tear it with your jagged teeth fling yourselves seething winds in circles upon the blue black water swirl leaves and dance amid the chaos of breakers flicker birds an instant against the tawny tiger throat of the sun which is snarling in the west beat down o oh great winds westward loose reins and gallop to seaward rush me too to that ocean in which i have found my goal lash me lap me rugged waves of blue-black water dash me clutch me and do not let me rest one instant all through the purple-blue night rock and soothe me till i awaken dreamingly at the faint rose breast of the dawn end of section section twelve of goblins and pagodas by john gould fletcher this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by nemo red symphony one over the ink-black cauldron of the sea heavily on wings of leaden cloud howling the sunset races out to assail me long have i voyaged night after night the gray rain swept the sea the heaving breakers hissed and quivered but held no light now my voyage is ending white storm winds have swept bare my soul with their harsh laughter their maddening mockery their bayonet thrust of despair over the keen clean-swept zenith roll crushingly huge masses of cloud dull ponderous sagging with the burden of creaking snow they drop flat on the sea they hang menacing over me they festoon the sun with swags of crimson light they stripe the horizon they bar every way with their iron tongues they loom weltering over my effort they steadfastly close me in meanwhile the sun with dying force wrenches one little crack in the midst of the sagging masses and i steer on to it like a crimson lake the light overflows and touches the bulging surfaces with carmine with scarlet with orange with vermilion with brick red with bluish purple with maroon with rose with russet with savage green with snowy blue with gray with ebony with gold it is the storm of the evening that races out shrieking to assail me and i hail it two the sky's vast emptiness is crowded with fragments colliding ragged splintered masses swirling away to the night the volcano of the sun has burst and split its crater black slag is hurled to the zenith above the red lava sea black shriveled charred fragments fall into the scarlet torrent huge tresses of darkness sweep over my face leaving me choking the sea is one crimson steaming fire each fanged wavelet flickers and dances about the one behind it hungrily licking at the ship fierce whirling swords tossed spearheads lance-like spit and stab then suddenly fall leaving me there on a rolling summit of flame facing a gulf of despair the ship lurches with ice-crusted prow into the wave trough and rises 
rapidly dripping liquid fire long twisted necklaces that burn out a green frozen chrysolite three over my head a bell beats it is midnight perhaps i will live to the dawn about me are the mouths of yawning furnaces and from these scarlet mouths the heat outpours and darts and licks its dry tongues at my brain till it too seems a black shell almost bursting with a force of flame in it still wearily i swing my shovel spattering the black coal over the pallets of the snoring mouths which rapidly swallow there is nothing else to do my legs seem melting away in sweat beneath me in my body my lungs and heart are fighting for air my eyes are seared by the appalling scarlet of the furnaces about me i scarcely see them my shovelfuls fall short with every swing without i hear the battering of the tempest the ship is pounded sideways by black immeasurable wave thrust and rising dizzily again like a half senseless fighter is again sent downwards by those unseen fists my shovel rises to the ship's slow recovery my shovel shoots out at the smash of toppling masses sometimes i pause and pant for an endless instant while the ship crouches quivering over my head a bell beats it is morning wearily i drop the shovel and drag myself to the deck four afar there is something that seems ashore the sky has been blown clean of clouds except to westward and these stare hard at me like huge sardonyx towers i cling to a half-shattered rail that reels and dances soused by the choking water my face a streaming mass of blood and salt and grime i wait and dizzily i try to remember what is this city that out there awaits me am i its conqueror will scarlet flags hang fluttering in the streets to greet my coming will crimson lanterns jingle and toss in festival tonight has the fire burned the ship and is the water but stinging icy fire that whips and sears my face down there the furnaces go out for the water sloshes about the floor and steaming acrid fumes arise no living soul could stay in such a place out here the decks are shattered the boats are shorn away and far on the horizon the city glares with its sardonyx towers now the red bells the black red bells the storm bells break loose from the horizon leaping upon the eastern sea and breaking it in their teeth the towers infuriate and kindle from base to summit in layers and orange terraces against the blue snow haze that drifts down on them from the east the ship of my soul is rolling to port at last with one clang from its heaving boilers one sigh from its shaking funnels one rattle from its loosened chains i will lash myself to the masthead and wait empty-eyed and open-mouthed till the city that is all one scarlet flame of death takes me to itself at last end of section section 13 of goblins and pagodas by john gould fletcher this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by nemo violet symphony one but yesterday 
Moon sails were raking high the harbor of my dreams. Dull night of trees, dark sorrows drooping, glittering raindrops gleam on you in recollection of my despair. But yesterday, stardust was scattered deep on the dark gulf of my dreams. Wind of the night, questing, swaying, calling, rustle of dull grasses, why do you trouble me? Yesterday, purple mist was powdered on the windless sea of dreams. Faces of the night that pass me, haggard, monotonous faces, wind-blown hair and lustful lips, I am not what you desire. Yesterday, one, two, sails above the mist, wind swallows that hover towards the rain clouds of the horizon, out of the reedy harbors, rocking, swaying, falling, blown to sea and parted, yesterday, yesterday. Two. Purple blue, bloom of night, globed grapes clustered morosely down the dark vineyards of untrodden streets. The noise of the moments is like the clash of the hoofs of a horse rattling, thin tattoo in the stillness. The noise of the moments takes me uncaring towards the day. With brassy crash, dawn's corabants invade and trample the vineyard. Like a fawn, I hide and watch them, a dark cup in my hand. Spoilers of my vineyard, spilling the lees of my sweet red wine. You will yet ask in vain for a cup that is not yours, a purple, dewy cup of lonely night. Tramplers in the morning, sunburnt faces and weary lips, there is yet a cup here you cannot have. I hold it in my hands. Would you drink of it? Lay down your thirst and timbrel. Break the harsh dance that flickers through the morning. Forget the scarlet perfumes of the day. Remember only starless night, cool swish of many seas. Faint pearl glow of evening, cool marble in the silence. Purple-blue grapes of night crushed freshly, deep sleep and the drowsy stars. Three. I love the night that in long violet shroud slowly and lovingly wraps up the day, hiding its blurred imperfections in endless tenderness. I love the day's high violet cone of light, with thin haze on the horizon like a wavering summer sea. But most of all, I love midsummer dawn, when far-off planes of light ascend and tremble together like distant purple waves, the sound of whose dim breaking is lost in the wild babble of awaking birds. 4. Twisted fragments of violet paper, the dawn drops you into the green bowl filled with the day's gray waves. I love the night's deep purple grapes that yesterday were crushed and spilled, and long and sluggish rivers that joined and made a sea, where, half guessed through the mist, two golden sails drifted on silently. The blue fume of my dreams is laced with violet flame. One golden sail alone came back to rest in its nest among the reeds. The other sail is lost behind the mist, beyond the craggy rock, about which race in jagged white the waves. Horizon on horizon far away she waits, but through the day comes no faint song nor creaking of the ropes. Twisted fragments of violet paper, charred and fallen, 
out of the green bowl lazily coils gray smoke end of section